Well, Kevin, looking forward to this show. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters, and, and we have um, a, a fantastic, fantastic guy with us, uh, Julian Gorbach, assistant professor at the School of Communications the Journalism Program, and he is so thoughtful, so philosophical. I really don't know anybody like you, Julian, honestly. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the show, Jay. Yeah, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> That's what says it on the cue card. <laughs> I'm just reading. I am good at reading the. You can say it so. again and again if you wish. <laughs> so, uh, so Julian wrote a book about Ben Hecht, and I think the first order and and it's it's out. It's on Amazon. You can uh, March fifteenth. Oh, March fifteenth. Okay, but you can buy it now. You can buy it now. You can buy it in Kindle, and you yeah. can buy it uh, in soft cover, uh, mm -hmm. pocketbook, um, not hardcover. No, no, okay. I, there, there won't be a hardcover edition. Okay, well, soon, you'll see. Um, and it reflects uh, 10 years of study and thought about Ben Heck that Julian's put into it. And since he's a young man, that's a good percentage of his life, I'm sorry to say. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what strikes me, and there are many things to talk about on Ben Heck, but what strikes me is that most people don't know who Ben Heck, Heck is. Uh, and, and it touched me to find out that he was part of the... Uh, the group that met in the Algonquin Hotel back with James Thurber and all that. Yeah. Uh, that it really, that struck me because th those are the guys, the thought leaders of the 30s and the 40s. Yeah. Um, and they were very important. They were the, the aristocrats of thought in this country, those guys. Yeah. And humor and wit and all yeah. that. And among them was Ben Hecht. So, 10 years you put into this. Why, Julian? Oh, wait. Who was Ben Hecht? We need to know who he was. Okay, well... Um Ben Hecht uh, was very, very famous in his day, which is um, why it's somewhat extraordinary that he's been so forgotten. Um, uh, and he still pops up, but I, I, you know, as you co correctly point out, a lot of people don't uh, still don't know who he is by name. Um, but he uh, he was famous, I think, in in two ways. Uh, one was that a lot of people consider him. Hollywood's most legendary screenwriter. Uh, he's on a par, in a way, with uh, Dalton Trumbo, who, who is another legendary screenwriter, slightly younger guy. Uh, and there was a film about Dalton Trumbo uh, a few years ago uh, with Brian Cranston, the guy who had, who had started Breaking Bad, playing Dalton Trumbo. Ben uh, Heck wrote Gone with the Wind. Well, he, he, he wrote the script for Gone with the Wind. Uh, he's script doctor. Oh, not the book, was, sure. Yeah, the right. Script. The screenplay. Uh, yeah, and he, he, they say he invented the gangster movie, and when you say that, you have Scarface. to understand. Yes, well, he wrote Scarface, uh, which was, of course, remade with Al Pacino in the early 80s, uh, but he, he uh, his version uh, came out in 1932, and um, uh, he, they, when they say he invented the gangster movie, it's because he, he was really the iconic figure who came to Hollywood right when movies started to talk. And that's when Hollywood brought in all the writers. And Hecht was the highest profile and highest paid of the bunch. And so we say he invented the gangster movie. This was a moment when you could invent a film genre like the gangster movie. He also was one of the inventors, one of the major inventors of, of the screwball comedy, which was kind of a, 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 a trademark of the period, that sort of fast-talking, wacky kind of comedy of the era. And he was really important in film noir. He wrote uh, one of his, maybe his greatest film, I think, uh, was uh, Notorious, which he wrote with Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. And then he was also famous because he was famous for his role in history, which is interesting, because he's unique among someone who's a literary figure who also played this extraordinary role in history, which is that he broke the American media silence of the, um, of the, the Nazi final solution to the Jewish question, because it, it really wasn't breaking through uh, in late 1942, early 1943, when the definitive information about it first reached the United States. It was buried in the press, and he really broke through to try and reach the public with this and call for the rescue of the Jews, uh, an effort that you know, tragically failed, um, and we ended up with the Holocaust. Uh, but one of the, the kind of the major story arc that I trace in my book that also kind of gets to why he was really important is here's a guy who started in Chicago as a crime reporter, uh, invents the gangster movie, and then because of this experience of the Holocaust gets 
essentially radicalized and ends up partnering with a Jewish gangster, Mickey Cohen, to smuggle weapons to Palestine in the uh, struggle for Jewish statehood. Yeah, his life changes dramatically. And, and what I read, there was a fellow named Bergson. Uh, I want to say Peter Bergson. Peter Bergson. Who, right. who, who changed him. And, and it's remarkable. And I'd like to hear about that from you. But what's remarkable is that here's a guy who's got everything going for him. And he's so, what, flexible and um, open-minded that one day somebody could change the arc of his life. One conversation, one meeting. According, according to what I read. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a few mysteries uh, to Ben Hecht. Um, I'd, I'd maybe identify three. And now, because uh, my book's coming out in another biography by coincidence, uh, which is kind of a really interesting synchronicity and, and maybe says something about uh, culture and history, that these things happen. And are they really coincidences? Or I mean, we could talk about that. But, uh, but three things that I think now the press is starting to ask that these these books are coming out so there was just a piece about uh adina hoffman's book which just came out um it was basically out this week um with uh Yale ben university Hecht. press yeah and and so she there's a major piece about ben hecht in the new yorker and about her book i guess they didn't know about my book and there just was a piece sunday uh in the wall street journal and the wall street journal one was aptly called a difficult man to pin down and i think the three questions that the press is starting to ask and query our books for is, uh, one, um, so here was a guy who maybe should have been a great literary figure, but instead is, is, has this enduring reputation as like a Hollywood hack. Like that, that's arguably why you've never heard of Ben Hecht, is that he was dismissed. He could have been a great literary figure and said he was dismissed as a hack writer for Hollywood, even though he wrote a number of great films, and I would argue did a lot more than that. Uh, the second question, to get to your, your point that you just raised, is uh, Hecht, the, the phrase Hecht uses in his autobiography is, I turned into a Jew in 1939. He said, the Nazi murders of the Jews recently begun brought my Jewishness to the surface. And that was the Bergson connection? Yeah. Now, Bergson came to him in, you know, early 41, or, or, or actually August 41, I think. Um, and so there was a pivot. I mean, he was already becoming active and involved. And I think a lot of that, uh, well, there's a question about that. But certainly one factor was uh, Heck's wife, Rose who was more you know, politically active and tuned in and, and encouraged him to get involved. Uh, but So the first question is, why did Heck become, become a hack? The second question is, how is it that Heck, who had, had never really made a, any kind of a deal about his Judaism in, the mid, uh, in his middle age, suddenly turn into a Jew? I mean, the, his explanation is, it was the Nazi Holocaust that woke me up, or the, the you know, by the late 30s, the rising Nazi menace and the per and Kristallnacht and the persecution isn't, of the isn't Jews. Isn't that a credible explanation? Uh, I think that, that it is on a certain, if you, if you just accept a pure political explanation. But I think there's a much deeper, both personal and professional, in terms of his literary career explanation that ties all of this together that we can get into. But um, the third question would be, um, and, and some of this isn't even really being asked. Like, I didn't feel like as, as capable a writer as David Denby is for The New Yorker, he even really broached this question. I think that, um, that the Wall Street Journal piece did. Um, but uh, does Hecht have a message for today? I mean, is it, is it just kind of another book out or another couple books out that, oh, all of a sudden we're talking about Ben Hecht? And I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. But, but I want to go back to the question I, I, I started to ask at the very yeah. beginning. You have 10 years into this. Yeah. That's more than the writers uh, in The New Yorker. That's more than Hoffman, who wrote the other book that came out recently. Right. Um, you are the past master of the subject, let me say. And your book is um, deep and philosophical, and it asks a lot of questions about him. It tells us more about him than, than at least Hoffman does. And my, my question to you is, why? That's a good part of your life. You've invested into this one study, this one book. Why did you get into this? Was it, was it something about the Holocaust also? I mean, honestly, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what kind of a story I was on to at the beginning of it. I, there's, a, there's a very personal reason, which I, I guess I'm not uh, uncomfortable to share uh, with everybody, which is that uh, as a young man myself, I mean, and maybe this is why I find Hack's discovery of Judaism so interesting, but 
When I was in college, uh, kind of like my first love in a way, was a young woman who left to go to Israel. And I had never really embraced my Jewish background, um, uh, and I'd never really embraced um, the state of Israel per se as something I, I had much focus on. Uh, I consider myself kind of a rebellious bohemian kid, and it didn't seem very hip or cool to be Jewish or uh, to be involved in, or interested in Israel. Israel didn't seem very what cool. What school did you go to? Uh, I went to a alternative high school, so uh, an, a kind of an art school where I would met this young woman, um, and uh, named the Cambridge School of West. And then I went to Sarah Lawrence College, which was kind of a bohemian school for writers. And um, and and when we started to uh, get together, um, or when we were talking, and I was pursuing her, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, the the first Gulf War broke out, and she was in Tel Aviv, and and. If, if anyone remembers, there was a January 10th deadline when George H. W. Walker, the, or George, what is it, Walker the first, uh, um, uh, had a set a deadline for Saddam Hussein to get out of Kuwait, and if he didn't do it by January 10th, um, we were going to go to war. And um, Iraq had Scud missiles that that everybody feared were loaded with chemical warheads, um, pointing at Tel Aviv. And up until early January, and, and, and as far as I knew, it was going to be up past the deadline, um, this young woman was um, in Tel Aviv. And um, suddenly, um, all of these questions about kind of who I was and what I believed in um, came up, and I didn't have answers for them. I I'd read, actually, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a young man. I just read it where he argues, Joyce argues in the book, that, that your family, your religion, and your nationality are the nets that, as an artist, keep pulling you down to earth. And so Stephen Dedalus, the, the protagonist of The Portrait of the Artist, uh, has to break free of his family, his religion, and his nationality in order to, to be an artist. And he says, I will endure whatever consequences happen to come from that. He's a young man, you know, and, and uh, doesn't know, but he says, I'll endure it. And, uh, and, and, and so it, it, th these world events that affected me very personally came at a real, really critical moment in my intellectual uh, development. And then I never resolved it. And I became a reporter. And then the 9-11. The, uh, Did you know about Hecht when you became a reporter? Um, I, I was vaguely aware of the front page. I, you know, I knew that that was an iconic um, play a comedy about uh, reporters. And I, I, you know, even that, I gradually grew into being a journalist and then became a full-time journalist. Um, and, but I didn't know really anything about him or much. And then um, the first Gulf War, I mean, the 9-11 the, the attacks happened. And I wanted to go cover the terrorism and the war in Afghanistan, a lot of things that, uh, that, that again, kind of came, came to the surface for me. But right as I was planning to kind of go off on my own, um, I, kind of on my own dime into uh, that, age, that area, um, Danny Pearl was captured and beheaded, an American Jewish How correspondent. How well I remember. And I just thought, um, I don't know if it's really sensible for me um, to go there, you know, without any promise from any publication. I mean, I'd... I'd had a couple years under my belt as a staff uh, writer for, for a couple of newspapers. But I didn't know whether it was really um, wise for me to go off to countries where war, war zones, where I didn't speak the language, where I was going to be dealing with the, all these shadowy things. And I didn't have the experience as a foreign correspondent. And I didn't even have a newspaper that I was connected to at home. So I didn't go. And I watched the entire thing of the war in Afghanistan, the whole war on terror kind of unfold while I stayed in the States and continued to cover kind of local news and to some degree la national news as a reporter, feeling like I was kind of left on the sidelines. And so when I knew I wanted to, to get a PhD, I wanted to do it about the Middle East. I thought, well, maybe I'll go there. But I, I wanted to confront these issues that for all these years, these 15 years by that time, had, I'd never addressed. And an Israeli scholar had said, well, why don't you look into Ben Hecht? He, uh, he's, uh, he was a reporter, and he played this 
important role in Jewish activism. He kind of woke up to his Jewish identity. I think you'd find it an interesting story. And when I got involved, I, I, um, there's so much to hect. Um, and there's been so much written about him being a hack and him not really being worth remembering um, that I was slow to kind of realize what a great story it was. First of all, it was a difficult thing to get your arms around as a young scholar because he, he wrote, you know, between 70 and, I mean, he had his hands in over 140 films. And uh, there's about 30 plus books that he published. Uh, and then a whole run of uh, Broadway hits. And then his entire output of propaganda that he did uh, during the Holocaust and the kind of uh, struggle for a Jewish state. And TV scripts and radio scripts. I mean, there's, there's a massive archive of his work uh, at the Newbury Library in Chicago. And getting through that took me a long time. And, and then realizing the, the breadth of the story and then, you know, you don't want to, when, when you're, especially when you're a budding scholar and you're doing a biography and you're focused on someone, you don't want to leap to the conclusion that they're so important or that they're such great writers. And so it, was, it was... he part of your scholarship? Was he in your dissertation? He was my dissertation. Ah, so, okay. so my book was, was my dissertation. Okay. And, the, and I should say that the, that the book, that the dissertation's title, which wouldn't have worked for the book, was Crying in the Wilderness which you and I were talking about yesterday, which is the idea, that's a line of, from the prophet Isaiah, which is that the role of the Hebrew prophet is to preach not to, um, not to the Philistines or the Babylonians, but to the chosen people, uh, because they're the ones who should know better, and they're the ones who are failing to uphold their covenant with God. And I thought that was an interesting analogy to heck, because he really took on the liberals in America, he took on Roosevelt, the Roosevelt administration, and American liberals and American liberal Jews. It sounds and, to me like you were involved in, in the scholarship. Yeah. You were involved in an epiphany of your own. Uh, that you, you know, you came also from a background that wasn't necessarily religious or identified closely with Judaism. Yeah. Uh, and and just like just like Ben Hecht, you went down a path that took you closer, at least to Israel. Am I right? There's a comparison there. As a matter of fact, I want to ask you the bottom line question. Yeah. How much of this is you? Oh, I, I mean, I think that um, I learned a lot about myself maybe from, uh, from writing the book. Um, I certainly learned a lot about myself as a writer and scholar. Sure, you're, you're remarkable. You, there are points of similarity. For example, um, my reading, 10 years. He committed 10 years, Ben Hecht, uh, to trying to get the story out about the Holocaust. Yeah. He, said, he said, I'm going to spend 10 years doing this, and he did do it. And, of course, it was an important part of his life. The same number for you to, to spend on him. Well, I guess he's, he did spend 10 years in being involved in Jewish politics. And then um, you and I have talked about, uh, off air, we've talked about the disagreements among Jews. And it was the bitter fights between Jews that in 1948, tech, because, because basically there was... Uh, there was an exchange of fire between Jews in the middle of the Arab-Israeli war, where a number of Hecht's allies, you mentioned Peter Bergson before, a number of the people allied with Hecht and Peter Bergson in Palestine were killed in this exchange of fire. Between friendly the fire, two. so to speak. Well, it wasn't friend. I mean, if friendly fire means when you direct fire at your friends, then it was friendly fire. <laughs> but it was one faction of... Um, it was the, the newly minted IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, firing upon an armed ship that had Hex friends and his faction of, of, of um, Israelis, or new Israelis, aboard. And m several of them were killed. I think something like 19 people were killed aboard that ship. And at that moment, Hex turned his back on the state of Israel and never set foot in the country again. So that, that put a bookend on, on Hex's direct engagement with the state of Israel. He had, a, um, he had a lot of direct, you know, the, the man was like all over the map. Uh, hebephrenic, if you will, jumping from one thing to another to another to doing journalism, to doing movie scripts, to doing books. I, I'm, I, mean, I know I'm missing some things. And then he gets involved in, in, um, in the Holocaust and publicizing it. He gets involved in the state of Israel up to his eyeballs. I mean, each one of these steps was he's all in. He was all in on everything. Well, I mean, I think one thing that, that people would maybe help people as a way to understand Hecht as a writer was that um, 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna mangle the pronunciation of the word, but it's a Shahrazad or whatever from the the heroine, the fictional heroine of a thousand and one Arabian Nights, the woman who has to tell the Sultan a different story every night in order to stay al uh, alive, and then that becomes all the you know the uh, tales of legend, the Arabian tales of legend, like Sinbad or whatever. Hector was this person who could endlessly spin one tale after another. That's why he wrote over 70 films in all these different genres uh, and all these books and everything else. He, you know, so he just had this incredible capability as a storyteller. And then all of this involvement, you know, and in, in all these different media, which made him a multimedia figure of, of the early 20th century. And then there's the whole political dimension and the whole question of his message. And I think that Hecht was such a frenetic, kind of protean, multidimensional figure that he overwhelms, you know, he, he'll overwhelm the New Yorker critic trying to do a 2,500 word piece on him, or the Wall Street Journal reviewer who's struggling to kind of try and figure out what his significance was, or, or any number of biographers who try to get their arms around this guy. And I think that in itself is kind of maybe one reason that we've forgotten him, is that he, he sort of, by his sheer sort of like, uh, who he was, the, his force of personality, he's kind of overwhelmed this and we don't know what to say or how, how to understand Well, he also alienated people. I think that's part of... Well, he was a provocateur, but he... I mean, he, he, he had the, uh, the British Film Association uh, shut him out, boycott him from all the theaters for a while. Right. He, he, uh, he was, he, at the same time as the Hollywood blacklist, which of course happened because of, um, uh, you know, communism or, or uh, accusations. Of, that, yeah, yeah, during the McCarthy or accusations of communist affiliation among screenwriters. Uh, Hecht was boycotted by England, which cut off a major market. And so Hecht was able to, he, he significantly reduced for, for a period of time there his screen work. But he also, to the extent that he did write films, he, he had to write under a pseudonym. And yes, it, it was, uh, I mean, to some extent, he's been sort of like embraced or taken up as an icon of the right. Um, and, and maybe to some degree the pro-Israel right that sees him as very hawkish and unapologetically pro-Israel and, you know, the fact is, is that he's a pretty complex figure. And we, when we try and just graft him into our modern political, contemporary political context, we do him a bit of an injustice. But he was very much a pr provocateur. And, and the most, the incident that sparked the, the, the British boycott and that was the most controversial was his infamous letter to the terrorists of Palestine. So in the late 1940s, um, the Irgun, which was the Jewish underground group that Hecht was affiliated with, um, w which he was basically uh, essentially funding or, or publicizing in America with the things he was writing, um, was, uh, was, were, were bombing and, and shooting the British in Palestine. And, and most famously or infamously the, the bombing of the King David Hotel, which, which killed 91 people. It, it took out the the Central Investigative Unit of British Intelligence, which was on one of the floors, but it also killed quite a number of civilians in the, the Irgun, so we didn't mean well, we to. We forget how violent those times were. That was yeah. violence everywhere in Israel then. So they were called terrorists, and they were called gangsters, which is relevant. Like the, the, the rhetoric of the era very much was to call the militant Zionists that Hecht was engaged with gangsters, Jewish gangsters. Mm -hmm. And, and Nicky um, Cohn was... It was part of that whole description. Right? Well, I mean, not, not yet. You know, during the, the period of the 1940s when Hecht and the Irgun are being called gangsters, Hecht hasn't made his, his partnership with Mickey Cohen yet. Okay. But in Palestine, um, one of the spin-off groups of the Irgun is robbing banks to carry out assassinations during the war of, of British to, to carry on this armed struggle. But in any uh, case, uh, Hecht's kind of controversial role culminates in 1947 when he, he says, you know what, you're going to call us terrorists, I'm going to embrace the label, and he puts out, as was their want, they did this throughout the 1940s as their publicity campaign, he puts out this full-page newspaper ad that's headlined, Letter to the Terrorists of Palestine, and it runs in the New York Times, it runs in all these major national newspapers, and it says, um, every one of the, the lines in it is, every time you... Uh, to, to, the, to the terrorists of Palestine, the Jewish terrorists. Every time you blow up a British train or shoot a British troop, the Jews of America have a holiday in their hearts. I mean, this is 
<laughs> Shocking. That's provocative, man. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and so, um, so part of the fallout of that was the boycott. But it also, it also raises all these questions of, was this guy just crazy? I mean, imagine, you know, when we have irresponsible rhetoric now, the way just people, you know, come down on it and the, the person is immediately discredited and dismissed and everything. Must have been what happened to him, right? To some extent, and I think, again, these are, these are sort of reasons why people wanted to uh, dismiss Hecht and forget about it. But, yeah. you know, I would argue um, that this whole story, I mean, you were asking about the message that it had for me, and it very much, doing all this research did have a message for me. It did change the way I look at our media and the way I look at our society, very much so. Um, and it's been reflected in the conversations I've had with you on air before here. Yeah. Uh, but it also... Um, it, it's a message for today. It's a, I think it's a message for our society today. What's the message? Can you, can you, I know there's a lot in the message, but right. can you give us a, a handle on how it changed you, how it, how it changed uh, you know, your way of looking at the world as your way of looking at the world exists today? Well, I mean, I would say that, that um, if you really want to get, what, what I ended up coming to the conclusion, that if you really want to get to the root of it, um, Hecht says in his autobiography, there's this phrase that I got from Joseph Conrad, and I think it's from the heart of darkness, uh, the soul of man. And that that phrase, he says, has been haunting me all my life. And Hecht basically had, came to a very dark conclusion about human nature. He, he began to develop this dark conclusion about human nature as a crime reporter in Chicago in the years leading up to the rise of Al Capone. Um, he became a foreign correspondent uh, right on the heels of his tenure as a, as a crime reporter in Chicago in Germany, right in the, in the immediate aftermath of World War I. And this confirmed his dark view of mankind. And then the rise of Nazism further kind of validated for him this dark view of humanity. And, and I would just say that if you have a certain read of human nature, if that's your a philosophical position that you start from, then it, it, it flows, it has all of these resonances in terms of how you understand the media, how you interpret democracy and its prospects, um, and how you interpret the law and order, mm. uh, how you interpret the role of government. Mm. Um, and so, you know, Hecht had a very con, uh, consistent I mean, there, there, are, there are contradictions that Hecht wrestled with throughout his life, and he was not a simple, one-dimensional thinker. He didn't come to a simple conclusion that humanity is bad uh, and, and go from there. But he, he did come to this very, these very dark, and, and, and I'd say more than that, more rather specific views about why humanity is bad. And then he had a very coherent, through all his ovures, his, his plays, his films, his, his uh, prose, this was his, the theme of his life. Was, it, was the dark view helpful in terms of, of finding the success he found? Would he have been as successful with another view? I don't think that he would have had as, you know, uh, the, word, the word David Denby used, which I had to go find a synonym for when I, when I had to kind of address it, was he said the, his blistering attacks uh, during the 1940s. He, he had these, you know, at least these scalding attacks on society and politics. And I don't think they would have been as caustic um, and as penetrating. And maybe he would not have had the same success. Well, and, and I'll as, say as this. As a provocateur, whatever. The, the, you know, when we talk about the title of my book, Crying in the Wilderness, the original, or the, the title of the, of the dissertation, the idea that, that Hecht had this almost prophetic side to him. Hecht wrote a short story called uh, The Little Candle, and uh, it, it was published in June of 1939 uh, in his book called A Book of Miracles. And it, it, he arguably wrote it right after Kristallnacht, but it describes in horrifyingly vivid terms the Nazi Holocaust, the complete genocide of the Jewish people. And when he wrote it, there was no Holocaust. The Nazis themselves didn't have a final solution he to the Jewish saw. question. He foresaw before the Nazis themselves foresaw their final solution. And again, that prophetic nature. And also when you talked about Bergson and whether Bergson changed him and you know, the moment that he had, this critical moment that he had in 1939, caught up in that was his dark view of mankind. And so the role Hecht ended up playing in history 
kind of this is so uh, so interesting. Flows from there. So I mean, you know a lot about it, and you wrote a lot in this book. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a small book. It's not a small book in size or in scope. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if, uh, with all modesty, I wonder if you could compare your book in terms of incisiveness against uh, the Hoffman book on on uh, on um, Ben Hecht. Yeah. Um, and and the new uh, the New Yorker article and. And the, uh, what was the other one? The uh, Well, I think that's it for, for now <laughs> that's come out. Okay. Well, there was an original book, you know, in 19, yeah. there, was, there was a biography in the 70s that, that called for a reevaluation re of Hacked and said that. So where, where do you fit in the landscape? I mean, with all modesty, um, the level of incisiveness, the level of philosophical understanding of the man, of, of, his, of his inside and his corners outside. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm still... Um, uh, you know, kind of reading and, and, and looking into what Hoffman has to say about it. So I don't, I don't want to say anything too conclusive about her book. And, and even if really I had something conclusive to say, I might hold my tongue, uh, you know. Although I think it's an excellent book, I could say that right now. I mean, she's an amazing writer, and this is, I think, her fifth. And, um, <laughs> but uh, to give some context, so this, this book comes out in the 70s and kind of argues that Heck's been overlooked, that he, he, he needs to be reevaluated, mm -hmm. and that book's been long forgotten. A book comes out in 1990 or so by someone who is a real film buff um, that ends up getting, I think, a little bit, I mean, it was a real labor of love, this book. It took the guy many, many years, and he interviewed a lot of the important filmmakers that worked with Heck, like Howard Hawks and these other folks. Um, and so it's kind of an important contribution, but the book kind of fails, and it, it never really addressed... Heck's role in Israel, like Heck's ro role with the Jews. Uh, which, which is the most, actually, looking right. back, it was the most important thing in his life. Right. So, so then we have 30 years of silence, where Hecht is, you know, kind of, is, is drifting into obscurity. And then by this bizarre coincidence, which is really all you can call it, or synchronicity, we have two books by Hecht, my book and hers, which I, I think are neither of them are insignificant efforts, that happen to come out within a month of each other. Is it, is it just a, an accident, a coincidence, or is there is there something here where the art uh, runs a parallel to what's going on in Washington, what's going on in the world? Um, do you think there's something to be said about how these books uh, help explain or criticize what's going on? Well, I mean, you know, maybe maybe. For those of us that scal uh, study literature and study history, uh, there's a part in the back of our minds that always says this, this stuff is really just paper and can just drift into the wind, whether we're talking about our his history. All history really is is our conjecture about the past. It's not the past is gone. Um, and that, that uh, with literature, that, uh, that it's, we, we may tout people, but you know, at the end of the day, so much of it just seems to drift into the past. But th this, to me, is, is kind of a really strange uh, piece of evidence that, that maybe literature and history almost like have a life of their own and that they will come knocking, that, that, that Hecht was kind of out there in our sort of collective unconscious. And it was, it was just like we have, like the way you might have a Freudian slip when you're with the lover or, um, you know, uh, a, a, a politician may have a gaffe and actually say the truth of what they say. You know, there's these, or, or when you have a dream and suddenly something in your life that you were, that was sense. bothering you, yeah. it's like an epiphany that you, that you have to have yeah. the dream to have. That there's this, that there's things going on in our collective unconscious that come up to the surface collective at critical yeah. moments. Yeah. Our collective unconscious. And, and so maybe history talks to literature and literature talks to history both ways. Yeah, I mean, it, or maybe both independently have a force. I mean, it's interesting because Hecht was both a figure of literature and a figure of history. And it's almost like we're, we're hearing a knock at the door and we open that we, we didn't invite anybody, but all of a sudden there's a knock and Ben Hecht is here. And I would argue that, you know, regarding the things that his take on human nature and his take on politics and the media, um, he speaks very powerfully to the Trump era. Yeah. And he also has, I th you know, you and I have discussed a lot to say about Israel as well. Well, so, yeah, I so I wanted to ask you this. Um, you know, here we are, um, and you know him as well as any man alive uh, and any woman alive. Um, what, what would you distill from what you know about him to be 
the message he would give were he with us here today? Well, I mean, I drew a message. I, you know, I think the thing about doing a biography is that as, as, as sort of brilliant or, you know, for, for all of Heck's um, virtues, and they're not insignificant. I mean, we can talk about what a horrific thing it was to make the statement that he made in 1947, but you also have to say this was the guy speaking loudest to demand Jewish rescue at a time when nobody else had his kind of clarity. Um, and that's a story in itself that I don't know if we'll have time to get into, but he did have this kind of role as a hero at a certain point, but for all of his many significant virtues, um, we have the benefit of hindsight. And so I think I have kind of a message about his life. I think his message was about mankind's darkness. And, uh, and it was this idea that uh, he thought that, that, that some of the very strong impulses that people have are their fears and resentments of their other, their, their tribalistic impulses, um, their prejudice. We're seeing that. And, and, that, and, and so that he, he, at one point, when he was talking about Germany right after World War I, he said, the decency of mankind is a small mask. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, he, so he, he often had this very dark view, and he felt that, that there was this dark potential that it, all it took was the wrong person, or you could say the right person, that the demagogue, like a Trump, to come in and stir that up, and all of a sudden it would rise to the um, to the surface. And I did in Europe. And I think to some extent, you know, we've been arguing the wall, the wall, the wall, the wall for weeks. And a lot of times they will say, you know, the, the pundits will come on, and I, I don't know that any of them are forgetting this. Maybe they don't say it clearly enough, but they'll say he's lying. It's not true. He's lying. It's not true. That's not what's important. What's important is that he is using an age-old uh, tactic, which is to find a scapegoat, to find someone to invent an enemy, and to draw on our hate in an opportunistic way to whip up power for himself. You know, that, that that's what you know, Trump is doing. And um, that that's what's horrifying about the wall, and, and that that's what's meaningful about the moment that we're in. Mm. So, uh, yeah, then the second part of that is, uh, so uh, as we've discussed, Ben Hecht um, criticized the press for failing to cover the story of the Holocaust and dedicated years of his life to try to tell that story, despite um, the unwillingness of the press in general to cover it. So the same kind of thing exists today. There are certain things that are not being covered. Uh, what would Ben Hecht tell us today about that? in journalism, in the press, in the media? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, first of all, to clarify, so that, because I think if we were a little vague, we say, oh, the press wasn't covering the Holocaust, people say, oh, that's not true, how can you say that? But, you know, when the final solution to the Jewish question, when, they, when, the, when the Nazis organized and rolled out a systematic um, plan to, to commit genocide, when they had the train system and the killing centers and the, and the gas, all of that, um, the, the State Department played a role in suppressing that information, okay? And, and then the, to the extent that the press was getting wind of it, they didn't, like the news that the, that the Nazis were promising, so, so by, by the late 1942, two million Jews were dead, and the Nazis promised another four million dead Jews by the next Christmas as a Christmas present to the world during 1943. And that did not make headlines. And, um, and so that was when we say Heck punctured the media silence of the Holocaust, quote unquote. We're saying he, he brought the news of the final solution. He, he, he created this massive uh, pageant at Madison Square Garden um, called We Will Never Die in, uh, in early March of 1943. To, to, you know, and he, and he, he, the, the cast was full of the Hollywood celebrities that were Heck's friends and allies. And, you know, uh, 20,000 people, I think it was 40,000 people, they, they had to have two shows the night of the performance because they filled it to capacity. And then it went on a tour, which by the way, the other Jewish groups tried to suppress. But it did, it brought the news of this, uh, of the final solution to the front pages, finally. And um, when we say that, that what, what, I, what I've asked you and what, what I've uh, uh, pondered, I don't, I don't ask it in the book, but uh, because the book stays with the history. But what I've asked 
um, whenever I've had the opportunity to talk about it, is if Hecht were alive today, and or if we're just talking about what is the great story of our lifetimes or of the century that he's missed? Because arguably, you know, the Nazi solution to the final uh, question was one of the great stories of the 20th century that the media, that the American press fumbled, okay? So what, what would be the great story of that today? And I say it's, it's got to be, I wouldn't even say it's climate change because it's bigger than climate change. It's the, you know, Elizabeth Colbert won, um, the, who's a writer for The New Yorker, won, I think it's the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction for a book called The Sixth Extinction, in which she argued that there have been five major extinctions in the history of life. And that we, that mankind, the last one was created by an asteroid, right? Um, hitting the planet, creating the ice age, and making the dinosaurs <laughs> extinct. And she's saying, we are now creating a sixth extinction. And with this extinction, we are the asteroid. We are hitting the planet, and we are, we are creating a massive uh, global extinction. And that's a complete collapse of the global system. That's even bigger than global warming. And that, that is an unfolding within our century. And people might say, well, how, how does like, the Holocaust relate to this environmental story? I don't get it. It's two, two completely different things. And this is where I think, again, the nature of man comes in. Because I grew up during the Cold War. So one of the, the big basket of events that changed the world of that critical era that Hecht was part of was the Holocaust. You know, and obviously the Second World War itself. But it was also the atomic bomb, right? And I grew up during the, the Cold War, um, the high Cold War, I guess, uh, the late Cold War under Reagan with the arms race. The first time I ever went to a political rally was a no nukes rally in the early 80s. And I remember my consciousness, my political consciousness was, was, was woken up by this idea of, oh my God, people, mankind is so crazy that we're gonna kill ourselves. And then, you know, the Cold War ended, and there were, were, the, were the nuclear talks and disarmament, which Hecht is now, by the way, just pulled out of. Um, and so even though uh, actually the nuclear threat never completely went away, that kind of intense consciousness that we had about it in the popular culture of the 1980s that formed kind of my you know, young years um, has shifted a little. But it's, you know, it's, it, it left me thinking uh, what, what is like that now as kind of a worldview? If, if I was 16 now, when I was listening to The Clash and London Calling and it was all this nuclear uh, imagery and everything, this apocalyptic imagery, what would be that, would there be any of that imagery today or is everything just, uh, you know, wine and roses now? And I think that my, if I was a kid now, or, or, or me now, actually, frankly, it's, it's this environmental destruction. And, but again, it's mankind, it's humanity as this destructive, this self-destructive engine. I mean, if we wipe out, now it's bigger than us just wiping out other people. Now it's about us wiping out everything that's alive. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the same big story. And yeah. there's the same risk of us. And I think this also goes to human nature, the notion of denial. That I think that the reason why you know, as media critics, we say, oh, well, is it the money in politics? Are the media people chasing the profits? You've sort of theorized that. You know, and there's another thing, which is to say, because people are the way they are and they can't, part of the reason why we're so self-destructive or destructive is that we are often so deep in denial about our destructiveness. And the media is the incarnation of that denial. So with all of this, Julian, do you, do you adopt the dark view, the generally dark view that Ben Hecht had of the world? Um, do you think, for example, just one small point, do you, uh, maybe a larger point, do you think that climate change will be resolved? Do you think that humankind will save itself? Or would Ben Hecht say, no, not mankind, humankind is in, imperfectible in the old Locke-Hobbes uh, dichotomy, um, and that we will not be able to do it because it's not in the way we as a community operate. Uh, where are you on that today after all of this? Well, I would say yes and no. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that, that's the whole thing, right? And, and I mean, I could oversimplify Ben Hecht and I could say that uh, Ben Hecht had this dark view of mankind and that Ben Hecht, uh, you know, was, was um, too, wasn't sophisticated enough to embrace uh, any kind of complexities about that, that he just had this cynical view and that's it. That's the story of Ben Hecht. He was cynical. But that's not true. 
if you if you read his great work like like uh, or if you if you really look at it like notorious you see that he he was fascinated by paradox the thing that made him a great hollywood screenwriter and made him the bane of the studios was that he would create these contradictory paradoxical paradoxical characters right and so he understood you know, with, with the nature of man, I don't think he would write off mankind. But the story I tell in my book is the way his cynicism kind of blinded him. I mean, it, it led him to make, to do something like the letter to the terrorists of, of Palestine, which were we, when we're outside of the way he saw the world, we say, my God, what a, what a nut, you know? Um, and then it, what it led to was this friendship that he had with Mickey Cohen that went on for uh, 10 years. And what I argue in my book, or kind of narrate as a story, is the way uh, Mickey Cohen was able to manipulate Ben Hecht. Because, Hecht. because Hecht's cynicism essentially blinded him to the f how, what a psychopath Mickey Cohen really was. Because Hecht was so cynical about government. I mean, to speak to the, the times we're in now, Hecht saw government, and we can get into this, but as, as a criminal conspiracy, as a crime syndicate. Be you know, you re remember, this is the guy who kind of came of age in the Chicago of Al Capone. You got to so be it's cynical, not a, yeah. So it's not an abstract idea. I mean, Al Capone did run Chicago. He was the government of Chicago during Prohibition. So the idea of government as syndicate, or the Nazis being a gangster regime, these are not such metaphors. These, these, are, these are actual things. And we talk, we talk about this investigation going on into our own government now and what's happening. Um, so, you know, Hecht had these cynical views so that, so that he, he, he wasn't necessarily making a distinction between a real gangster and, say, the American government of law and order that was supposed to be cracking down. And that, that kind of cynicism, I think, I argue, kind of blinded him. And, and what I would say, the yes and the no, the reason why I say no, I do not agree with that, I do not think it's hopeless, is that as much as I could think you could say, okay, the rise of Nazism is evidence of the nature of man. Okay, the, the ar nuclear arms race is evidence of the, nu of the, of the nature of man. The, the havoc that we are wreaking on every living thing on the planet right now, the way we are exhausting it all, and with no apologies and no contrition and no plan to change, is, is uh, evidence of the nature of man. I think that in life, personal life, and in politics, it is deadly to surrender to that kind of cynicism. Because the moment you surrender to those conclusions is the moment you lose your moral compass. That's, that's when you become fascistic or, or whatever. That's, bec that's when you become the beast that you're, you're fighting. And you, know, you and I have talked about Israel, and, and, and all I'm trying to say when we, when, we, when we debate that is I do not want Israel to, to surrender to, Israel has to do everything it can, to f it's had to for, for its entire existence, to fight for its survival. But it cannot lose a space for its idealism as a democracy and as a country, or it will lose its way. It will stop being the kind of Jewish kingdom that people from Theodore Herzl to David Ben-Gurion built it in the darkest years of Jewish history to be. We're out of time, Julian. Okay. Thank you so much, Julian Gorbach. As yeah. always, a wonderful, brilliant discussion. Yeah, thank Can you. Can we do it again? Yeah, sure. All right. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> <sighs>